Bible says in 1 Corinthians, give none offense neither to the Jews nor the Gentiles nor the church of God. And so what you, have, you and I have in our Holy Bible is three distinctions made, three groups of people, if you will. The Jews, which we are not. The Gentiles, which if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And then the church of God. And if you're a Jew or you're a Gentile and you trust Christ, now you're part of the group, the church of God. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't matter your national race. You need to be washed in the blood of the lamb and placed into the body of Christ. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or if you're a Gentile. We're going to preach the same gospel no matter what your nationality is. The Bible also says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. The Ten Commandments in the Old Testament were given not to the Gentiles, it was given to the Jew, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. It wasn't given to us. So when we use the law now, we need to make sure that we use it lawfully. How is it used lawfully? Well, we've gone through a whole Galatians study. Um, so we're not going to rehash all of that. But Galatians 3 said, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That's how we use the law lawfully. It's designed to bring somebody to Christ to show them, well, that we might be justified by faith. In other words, you and I can't be justified by the law. Exodus chapter number 20. Let's go ahead and turn there. We're going to go through these Ten Commandments, and we're going to look at how they are restated in the New Testament and just some thoughts on how we can use it lawfully as we witness to this lost and dying world. Uh, we'll start at verse number three. The Bible says, well, at verse number one, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Well, he didn't bring us out of Egypt. <laughs> That's a specific group of chosen people out of the house of bondage. And then verse three, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That means it's not acceptable for somebody to say, fine, I'll take Jesus Christ and I'll put him up there on the shelf with Buddha and Muhammad and Hare Krishna and my rock and roll idol, and my movie star idol, and my, my parents' idol, and it's not acceptable. All of those other gods need to be knocked down and taken down. No other gods. There's not even a close third, fourth, or fifth place. And that's, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, because that's the state of our day. Well, all roads will just lead to heaven, except they won't. They won't all lead to heaven. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. First Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse number 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know... That an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. So if somebody says to you, the Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And they say, well, that's the Old Testament, and God gave that to the nation of Israel. You can say you're right, he did. Can we turn over to the New Testament now? <laughs> and you point them to this verse, and you can show them it's simply restated in the New Testament and something for us to all grab a hold of. The Bible goes on to say in verse 5, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, that's little g gods, as there be gods, little g gods many, and lords many. But to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we in him and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things and we by him. 
this is an excellent, excellent passage of scripture. When you're going through the law and trying to use it lawfully and trying to use it as a schoolmaster to bring someone to Christ, and you can go right to this New Testament passage and you can see it restated right there. We know the verse in 1 Timothy 2, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, men, the man, Christ Jesus. So this idea that I'm just going to program whatever I want into my GPS and make it God's plan of salvation, it's there's only one way and there's only one mediator and it's not a she, it's a he. So that means there's no mediatrix. Mary is not the mediator. No other way. The exclusivity of the gospel is what is offensive to people. Now, if you and I are mean and rude and short and arrogant and just puffed up, okay, now we're the offense. We need to repent. But if the exclusivity of the gospel offends somebody, good. You're using the law right. <laughs> it's going to bring them to Christ because they first have to come under conviction and see themselves as a criminal who has committed high crimes against the holiest of gods. And they've put in something before God and they have other gods before him. Exodus chapter 20. Second command. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my command. Now, growing up as a Roman Catholic, we did not have that commandment in our Bible. You say, well, how did they get Ten Commandments? Well, that's simply. That's simple. You just split the 10th one and you make it 9 and 10. And that's exactly what they did. And you know why they had to do that? Because you have a churchyard full of dolly statues. That's why. And you have prayer meetings full of beads that you flip to a mediatrix, not the one mediator. And they're all over. And that's what religion does. It doesn't matter if it's clothed in worldliness or if it's clothed in religion. It's the same thing. And God says, I don't care what you make or where it's made. Don't do it. We're not worshiping images. And people want to have this hallmark Christianity where there's an image I can look at. There's an image I can hold. There's something I can put up in my yard like a big fat Buddha in the back and have flowers and bow down and worship. It's all in vain. God hates that stuff. And he does not want us involved in it in any way, shape or form. We looked at this before. Uh, go to First John chapter five, if you would. First John chapter five. First John chapter five. We had gone through this and that when you read through it and at the end, it's almost like a PS. When you when you read it, all unrighteousness is sin. Verse 17, there is a sin out of the death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keep himself and that wicked one touches not. We know that we are of God. The whole world lieth in wickedness. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. We may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. And it's almost like verse 21 reads like a P.S. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. We'll just close it out there. 
You can take somebody to the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 20, show them God's second commandment, and you can flip over and cross-reference that right in the New Testament in 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Idols are all over. People are looking for somebody to worship. Brother Mike and I were talking a little bit after uh, doing fellowship. You know, he used to be in some things, and I was in you know some things at martial arts, and it's it's it, when you get down to it, it's all idolatry. <laughs> it's all vanity. I mean, it really is. There's always somebody to worship. Who is the next world champion that we can worship? You know, and, and what you do is, you know, you get, you get, uh, everybody wants to be on the podium, you know, so there's the first place and they get to stand up real high above everybody. And then, you know, the minions are here on the second, the second and third, you're the champion, you know, and it's all, it's all self grandiosing vanity. It really is. Um, that's why my wife just threw all of it away. <laughs> she the yeah, championship belt, they don't need it. The trophies don't need it. The medals don't need it. We got Jesus Christ, amen. We don't need any worldly trinkets. We got the Lord on our side. We don't need anything but Christ. Christ is all I need. It's that's a that's a true hymn, but people love love their idolatry. That's why the shows American Idol makes so much money. People want somebody. Give me somebody new to worship. Give me somebody new that I can market and turn them into a twofold, more of a twofold child of the devil than they are. But you can make that cross reference there. Uh, in verse number six, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The Bible says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's a pretty good cross reference, isn't it? Now, that's, that's, if you're a Christian, and if you love God, or if you say you love God, if I say I love God, wouldn't we naturally want to keep his commandments? I mean, gentlemen, we say we love our wives, but if she asks us to go mow the grass, or she asks us, hey, can you do this, do this, or if she asks us to do something, and we constantly, constantly give her grief for dare asking us to do something. Well, that doesn't really seem very like <laughs> if you love somebody, wouldn't you be happy to. Sorry if I got anybody in trouble tonight. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of work to do when we get home, uh, guys. So I'll switch gears quick. But I, I'm, I'm making light. But, uh, but, but it's true. If you love somebody. Why is it a chore to want to do something that makes them happy? When we play this game with God all the time, oh, God, I love you. We read some, something in the Bible that says, don't do this or do this, and then we get upset at God. That's not Christian. That's not loving God. Well, it is with our lips, and that's about it. We can do better than that because we have the Holy Spirit of God within us. Let's go back to Exodus. Look at verse number seven. The third commandment God gave the nation. The Bible says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So you just simply ask somebody. And this is an easy commandment because. Most everybody, unless they have grown up in a strict Christian home, have done this at least once, even in a Christian home. Because I can guarantee you that if you talk to Brother Kelly after church, he will tell you very specifically what his father would do if he mouthed the Lord's name in faith. <laughs> yeah. And it wouldn't happen again. Because God is. Holy, and he said, He will not hold him guiltless, he who taketh his name in vain. Go to First Timothy chapter number six. First Timothy six. A good one. It 
you know, because Christians will say, well, I, you know, I'm saved. I'm, well, praise God, you are. And I, and, you know, I don't, I don't curse God. And I've never said, I've never texted OMG. And, and praise the Lord, we should not speak like that at all. Watch what 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 says. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. You know, God and his doctrine are blasphemed if you and I as Christians disrespect or dishonor our boss. There's nothing worse than a testimony of a lost business person telling his lost business buddies, yeah, this Christian is real disrespectful. They say they're Christians. They don't even, they don't show up for work. That's dishonoring. They're late. That's dishonoring. They're disrespectful. They do a slack job with a slack hand. That blasphemes the doctrine of God. I and mean, that's what it, that's what it says in First Timothy. Go to Colossians chapter three, if you would. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the third chapter. We are told to put off some things. And in verse number eight, it says, but now you also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Just put it off. Don't use it because God said not to. Don't dishonor or disrespect your boss because you're going to bring you're going to bring blasphemy to the name of the Lord thy God. And he doesn't want that. He doesn't want that for us. All right, Exodus chapter 20. Let's go back there. We'll look at the fourth commandment. We're going to read through this fourth commandment, and then we're going to skip over it. Because we're going to do this at the end of the message. But we'll read it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor. And then wait for the government to send you money for the rest of your life. Which is, <laughs> Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. That means you work, I work, we get paid for our work. We don't sit around and wait for government money because that's wrong. That's not Christian. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle. Well, what do you send them out to work at like eight in the morning? No, you're 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 you're, you're hitching them up, you're you're doing stuff in, on the farm, and God says, and thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it we're going to come back to that at the end of the message we're going to speak more in depth because the Sabbath is not something that we keep as New Testament Christians we're going to find out why at the end of the, the second part of the message the next commandment the fifth commandment Young, young people, pay attention. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, before we flip over to the New Testament, let's say this. Do you see when it says in verse number 12, thy days may be long upon the land? God gave, when God gave this law to the nation, when they kept the law or parts of the law, it didn't affect their soul. It affected their physical living on the physical earth and their physical land. They obeyed God, crops grew. They obeyed God, battles were won. They obeyed God, they didn't get sick. 
They obeyed God. And that is how God blessed that nation when they obeyed the law that God gave them. But nobody was ever saved by keeping the law. Number one, because nobody kept it 100%. This is why we use it as a schoolmaster. God has always saved. We're not going to go down this rabbit hole, even though it's such a great hole to go down. God has always saved the same way by his grace through faith by what God revealed to, to, to those people. They don't have, they didn't have the truth revealed like we do today. They didn't have, oh yeah, turn to Colossians, turn to, they didn't have that. But the law didn't save them spiritually. The law saved them physically. They were blessed by God and their land was blessed. That's why it says, thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, there's always a spiritual blessing that comes along with obeying what God says. So that is certainly worth, uh, worth noting. Ephesians chapter number six. Ephesians six. The Bible says in verse number one, children, obey your parents for this is right. Except that's not what it says. In the Lord. Anytime you leave the Lord out, you've got a problem in your home. Anytime I leave the Lord out, I've got a problem in my home. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You know what Jesus did? He obeyed his parents. You know who knew more? <laughs> Jesus knew more than his parents knew, and he still obeyed them. Well, Dad, I think you're wrong with that. Jesus thought his parents were always wrong. <laughs> He's God walking around. Imagine being a mom and dad and going to that PTA meeting. What did your kid do wrong? What did your kid do wrong? Then it comes to Mary. Mine did nothing wrong. <laughs> that that sure probably didn't go over well with the rest of the rest of the mamas. Jesus, children. Jesus obeyed his parents and he knew more than his parents. I just know more than my parents. And if you don't think that now, you will by the time you're 13. You will. And maybe and maybe you're right. But guess what? So was Jesus. So obey your your parents in the Lord. Honor thy father and mother. Verse number two. Which is the first commandment with promise. Now look at this. This is a physical blessing that God gives you. If you obey this command. You can cross reference it from the Old Testament. And you can find it right in the New Testament. That it may be well with thee. And thou mayest live long on the earth. That's pretty good. You want to help plan? I mean, it's right there. It's right there. God says he will bless you with physical health to live a bit longer on the earth. Now, some of you might be saying, I don't want to live, I want to live less. The whole thing's getting so bad. I, you know, we all say we just feel bad for our kids and grandkids on where it's going to be in a decade, two decades, three decades. But nonetheless, we'll get, I said that we'll focus on God because he did say there's a promise there connected. With obedience here physically on earth. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15. Sometimes you make yourself a little chart, little notes. You know, you can keep it in your Bible, you know where to flip. If if you get into a conversation, it goes there, you're like, okay, I look at that and I've got the I've got the cross reference. However you want to do it. Uh some people have better memories and can, and can do it right off memory. But if not, uh, it'd be good to just have a little note card to put in your Bible. Fourth verse says, chapter 15, for God commanded, saying, this is Jesus, honor thy father and mother. He that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. That's a pretty big contrast to what the, what the curse is compared to the blessing. So, young people, what do you want? 
Blessing or cursing? Blessings. Always choose blessings. God is ready, willing, and able to bless you. He wants to bless you. So just come alongside. He's always got, he's always got your best interest in mind. And finally, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter number 2. And the 51st verse. Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Uh, well, verse 49, he said unto them, How is it that you sought me, wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understand not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. How can Jesus be subject? He came to do his father's business and he set the example. And as the son of God. Well, it's just God. It's hard to put a lot of these things into words. But Jesus wants you to honor your father and mother. And you'll get a promise along with that. All right. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 13. The sixth commandment says, very simply, thou shalt not kill. That's pretty easy enough. First Peter chapter number four and first John chapter number three. The two passages of scripture. First Peter chapter number four. And then get first John chapter number three. Those two places. The Old Testament command, the sixth commandment given by God is thou shalt not kill in Exodus chapter 20. First Peter chapter number four, uh, verse number 15. Says this. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busy busybody in other men's matters. If any man suffers a Christian, so this is talking to the brethren, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You know what God's saying? If you're a Christian and you and I are going to have to suffer for something, God tells the born again child of God, he says this. You better not be suffering and imprisoned because you're a murderer. You're going to suffer for the cause of Christ? Fine. You're going to be, what happened to Paul? Fine. But if you're going to get thrown in jail and you're going to have to go through some sufferings on this earth, you better not be going through it because you're a murderer. Because God, God don't want that. He doesn't want that at all. That's why he said, thou shalt not kill first john chapter three verse first john chapter three verse uh 13 marvel not my brethren if the world hates you we know we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren he that loveth not his brother abideth in death whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him Jesus that's why I said I am the way the truth and the life you're lost you're in death you're lost you're a child of the devil I was a child of the devil before I was saved when I got into the life the way the truth and the life now I'm in life I'm in Christ and I'm saved by his Life is blood. So you've got your cross reference. You hate, you hate somebody, you're a murderer. It's a pretty high ante that was just up, didn't it? Because a lot of people will tell you if they're good folks, I've never killed anybody. 
but we've all hated somebody. I've never hated anybody. Yeah. Tell me that when you just got shortchanged by somebody. Where did your and I's heart go to? I can't believe it. I'm going to get. We've all done it. We've all done it. And you can very easily point that out to somebody. When, when you show them, well, you know, have your, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. And, you know, kind of sets them up because they'll say, well, I've never killed anybody. I'm glad you said it. Let me show you what the Bible says in the New Testament. All right, we will do. We're good to go. Let's go back to Exodus chapter. Exodus chapter number 20. We're on the seventh commandment. Uh, in verse number 14, the Bible says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Let's get Matthew chapter 5 and Hebrews chapter 13. We'll spend a bit of time here on thou shalt not commit adultery. Matthew 5 and Hebrews 13. We'll get our, our verses. We'll make a few comments. If you are married this evening, you are under satanic attack, whether you and I like it or not. The devil hates the biblical definition of marriage. The devil hates that you are married happily and the devil hates that you are married happily as a Christian who has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So when you walk out of here this evening and you go about your business on Monday, you need to know that you are your marriage is under attack all the time. And you can know all the right doctrine. You can be against all the stuff that we're supposed to be against. You can vote conservative down the line for you, you can do all of that and still end up in a mess because Satan has ways of attacking and he's very, very, very powerful at it. So we must guard ourselves. And one of the ways we guard ourselves is one, realizing we're under attack. Number two, Always putting yourself in a position where there's accountability. And number three, praying to God for his help and for his guidance. He wants to destroy the home. And homes are being destroyed by the thousands because of this type of thing. Now, praise his holy name. There is forgiveness found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, this is a serious thing. In Matthew chapter 5, the Bible says this. Verse number 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Where does this stuff start? The heart. What needs to be made clean? You and I's heart. Well, I never did. Who cares what you did? Jesus said, if it's in your heart, if you've lusted, he considers you and I adulterers. Now, you can you can ask just about anybody that's over 13 nowadays because they just their minds are just so. So full of filth. Because of what's out there. It's another reason why we need to, as a, as a church body, we need to do all we can do to protect our young people against what is out there. So I try to preach the Bible, and then I trust that parents and grandparents will fill in the blanks and fill in the details based on what they feel is appropriate in their homes. So I'm gonna, I'll do my best to stay in my lane, and I trust that you stay in your lane. And we both do our jobs to complement one another so that we have young people that grow up and have pure minds and pure hearts and their eyes aren't burned out with filth by the time they're 16 years old. And it happens all the time, all the time. You take your kids to the park. You better be careful 
if they're sneaking somewhere around and some kid's got a phone and they want to try to show them something, it's vile filth that's out there. And children can't handle it. And they just, there it goes. Ruins their mind, ruins their heart. And that's where these thoughts of lust just brew and brew and brew. We need to be on guard. We need to be on guard in a big way. Hebrews chapter number 13. Somebody says they've never committed adultery. You can simply show them in Matthew chapter 5. If you've looked, you've committed. That should show them that they're not able to keep God's law and they are going to need some help. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number four. Here's what's honorable to God. Marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Are you married? You show your ID to God, he lets you in, and it's honorable, and the bed is up to God. That's how God set this thing up. Let's try to be a church that helps our young people get to the marriage altar undefined. That's the right way, that's the pure way, that's the biblical way. There's forgiveness found. Everybody has made mistakes. And everybody can be saved if they trust Jesus Christ. Because whether you committed the act or whether you had it in your heart, God considers you an adulterer either way. And you're going to have to be washed in the same blood. And if you've never murdered anybody, but you had it in your heart, God considers you a high criminal against him. And you need to be saved the same way, with the same gospel, the same blood. And that's just the way it is. So when somebody says to you, well, I'm, you're not that good. And if somebody says to you, well, I'm just so bad, good. Then the law has done its job. And now it's time for grace. The law is designed to show them that they need a savior. The law is designed to show them that they're under condemnation. They're guilty before God any way they go. You drop the, the mouse in the maze and it doesn't matter where he goes. He's done. And that's this lost and dying one. I'm so bad. I'm so wicked. I've done so bad thing. How could God? And right at that point, that's when you say, let me tell you what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross at Calvary. Why don't you trust him yet? I've done awful things. But I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I'm sure you've done awful things. If not, you've thought awful things. And if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, it's washed in the blood. And that's what people need to hear. That's what people need to know. There's only forgiveness and peace and love and joy. True peace, love and joy found in the person. Of Jesus Christ. He'll save the worst of sinners. Let's do one more. We'll do one more. And then we'll finish it up. The next time. The eighth commandment. Is thou shall. Not steal. Thou shall. Not steal. Ephesians chapter 4 and Luke chapter 19. Ephesians 4. And Luke 19. We'll get our passages and then we'll be able to flip there a little easier. Together. I'll tell you a lot of these youth groups. All it is is. Covert Christian dating and they, they got no <laughs> these parents sending their kids off to all these big mega mega deals They don't know what they're getting into They have no idea what they're getting into We're gonna have accountability here Okay, we're gonna have accountability and We're not sending 
our young people off to hide and do and what you no, we're not doing any of that. We're going to have accountability. If you can't do it in front of adults, then what's the, what's 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 the problem? What's going on? You get a kid, you get you get some uh, teenage boy comes in here, and he wants to start taking uh, some of the girls out to the pavilion by themselves. Uh, we got a problem. We got a problem, and we're going to handle the problem. We're going to go out there and say, carry on with your conversation. We're going to be there. We're going to be there. Adults are going to be there. Uh, that's called accountability. We have that accountability because kids, we, we love you and we want the best for you. We want to have every opportunity for you to live a life that's God honoring. And th this whole Laodicean Christianity is just disgusting. They don't care. They don't care. They're career preachers. And all they're looking for is a paycheck. And God just hates that stuff. Ephesians chapter number four. Thou shalt not steal. So uh, Ephesians four, verse number 28. Bible says. Ephesians four, 28. We'll finish up with this one. Continue next time. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor. So if you don't work and you're getting government money, you're stealing from me because I work <laughs> and I pay my taxes. And when you take the money that I worked for and when somebody takes the money that you've worked for and they don't want to work, that's stealing. God doesn't want that. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. God don't want you to steal. He wants you to work and he wants you to work with your hands. That's pretty simple. Luke chapter 19, verse number eight. Luke 19, verse eight. As Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, that means he stole, <laughs> I restore him fourfold. Now, wouldn't that be pretty good? Best thing you can do for a young person that gets caught stealing is to take him and say, we're going to go over to neighbor's house. And you're going to return the tomatoes that you stole from his garden. Well, I already ate them. Well, then you're going to grow eight more. And we're going to bring them over. Or you're going to take your money. We're going to go down to Publix or Walmart, whatever side you're on. And we're going. you're going to buy them and we're going to bring them back. Times four. Because stealing is wrong. And God doesn't want you to steal. And if somebody came and, and stole your livestock, how would you feel? Everybody knows that stealing is wrong, whether they're, they don't even have to be saved. This is why this command is so easy to go to. Have you ever stolen anything? No. Would you, how would you feel if somebody stole from you? Well, not good. That's wrong. Why is stealing wrong? Well, you just can't do it. Well, why is it wrong? It's wrong because God said it's wrong. People like the South because they like Southern manners, but they don't like the manner giver. You know why stealing is wrong? Because God said it's wrong. And you can have good manners your whole life and end up dying and going to hell because you haven't realized that you're a criminal before God. And so that's some two good verses to go. The Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. False teachers and this worldly establishment wants to steal eternal life from you. If you're born again, they can't. You're eternally secure. But 
These lost people, in a sense, they've been robbed because nobody has told them that they can have eternal life. So in a sense, they've been robbed. And it's our job to bring the glorious gospel. It stains the body of Christ. It, you know, a lot of these things. I've heard stories over the years. I've gleaned a lot of insight from what goes on from my pastor and my Bible teacher. Who's had. Multi decades of ministry experience. And. The doctrinal statement doesn't change on the website. But the preacher that was caught stealing money or the deacons that were caught fiddling with money or the leadership that was kind of putting money off to the side and wouldn't use it for this because they really had. That stains the body of Christ. And when all that comes to light, nothing about their doctrines changes on their website. They still believe the same thing about Jesus' death, burial and resurrection, his deity the virgin birth, end times, just go on down the line. It doesn't change, except a lot has changed. It stains the body of Christ. And the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Last verse, and I'll be done, because this is good. Go back, go back to Ezekiel chapter 34. This is good. Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34 and verse number one. Ezekiel 34, verse number one. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat. Ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. And you know what's going around all over this world? Like I said earlier, career preachers making millions and millions of dollars, extracting mammon, extracting money from Deceived people or ill-informed people and living fat off of them and making promises to them that aren't going to come true. And God hates it. And God help us. We are not. The people didn't profit. The people were stolen from. And it affected the whole flock. And you turn on all these TV stations. And you know how it goes. And God hates it. They're stealing from God's people. If they're saved. If they're not saved. Then it's just a double mess. It's a double mess. They've robbed them of eternal life. And now they're robbing them and stealing their money. So they can get fat. And buy their Bentleys. And get their big houses. And take their million dollar. Vacations and all the. All the bling that goes along with it. It's all a bunch of fooey. And God help us. God help us. To not even think about going down that road. We want to do it God's way. Why? Because if we love him. We would want to keep his commandments. Not come up with the stuff to make ourselves on the podium. Telling you, New Testament church, it's the Lord Jesus Christ has the preeminence, or every single one of us are sunk. Every single one of us. If the Lord isn't the head, and if Jesus Christ doesn't have the preeminence, and if his word isn't taught, we might as well just call this a social club. And we're not going to do that. We are not doing that. We've come, the Lord has brought us too far. So we're thankful for all he's done.